call to order the legislative matters committee meeting for November 13th. And uh, do you want to call a roll up? Sure. Councilor Murphy. I'm here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Shara. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. So we have approval of minutes of the 16th that those meetings minutes caught up with us. Did you all get them? First of all, approve them. That would be a real voluminous set. <coughs> Did you, you didn't see them? They're a hyperlink in the agenda. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, if you, they're there. Okay. Yeah, if you didn't see them, we don't have to do it right now. Hello. I, I'm hard of hearing. Yes. And I'm in the front row and I'm having a hard time. And there's no mic. There is no mic. So. Yeah. We'll talk loud. We'll, we'll, we'll talk as loud as we can. Thank you. We'll talk as loud as we can. So why don't we hold off on that if not everyone has seen them? Okay. Because they're, they're done for the 16th and the ones for September will catch up with us now that we're here. So it looks like it's about 5.05 and we have a posted public hearing. Um, public comment we're going to do as we come to each item on the agenda relative to the subject. So we'll get to it and you can comment on it when we're talking about it. And unlike council, you know, we can talk to you. So it's a little bit better than it is in council, under council. So do I have a motion to open a public hearing on a proposed zoning change? Uh, map change uh, from highway, a uh, change to highway business of two parcels of approximately one acre on King Street. Map three, parcels 12 and 19. We got a motion to so open. Second. Second. And Carolyn, you're the present. I think she has new copies for us. Yeah, so there, um, this ordinance is a really small map change to expand the highway business district on North King Street. Um, went to planning board, community resources. There were, there was just, this is just a change to clarify um, exactly where the line would be that it follows the 155 contour. So it's about, um, there are two parcels just on the Hatfield line that are actually, they're portions of parcels with frontage in Hatfield. The back portions of the property are in Northampton. They're currently zoned residential. Um, and so it would expand a portion of those properties to highway business so that it matches what the frontage is in Hatfield is business. Um, and the line would follow the property line for those portions up to the 155 contour elevation because that's sort of when the um, the ledge starts going up the hill to um, the backside of Coles Center Road. So this is the flat area of those parcels. And planning board have a comment on this? Yes. No, they're fine with it. Hmm? Sorry, positive recommendation from community resources. Positive from community resources. Good. Um, any other questions for Carol? We'll take comment on it if we're we're set. We're pretty much set here. And just this, this no issue with removing some of the water supply protection district. Um. No. Okay. Um. Okay. The area actually is um. Um. Just on the edge of that, so the bulk of the water supply is. Um, on the back side of that and flows towards, on the other side of the ridge. Okay, okay. So anything on this side is going towards the road, not over there? Yeah. Okay. So um, is there any member of the public here that would like to comment on this zone change up on the Hatfield Town line? Anybody here comment on the zone change, either in favor or opposed? Going once, going twice. Very good. No other questions for Carol? Motion to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Very good. Close the public hearing. Um, you want to take action on this now? A motion? A recommendation? Um, I move a positive recommendation. Second. Second. Is that any discussion about that motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Carol. Now we're doing. Um, temporary signs next and we have Alan with us tonight if there's any questions okay. for Alan and you have the do you have the version of it with that last sentence change yes so um, I have a copy of that as well there was from the last couple of 
times you guys looked at this, um, um, there was some back and forth about um, about flexibility with um, let me just add another copy, sorry. Um, um, so I just recommended that potentially you think about having an ordinance in effect from October, um, all year except for between the between October 1st and November 15th annually. And then um, Councilor O'Donnell, the last sentence, Councilor O'Donnell had a question about whether, you know, whether it was confusing that this only applies to temporary signs. So um, he added a, just a clarifying statement at the very 7.8, just to clarify that this really, it just relates to those temporary signs in residential districts. Um, Councilors, I know we had concerns about this relative to the election season. Is this language satisfying? So, um, so um, I have a question if we could frame it in terms of, um, and it goes back to something Councilor McDonald raised around we have primaries, and that sometimes we have elections that are outside of this time frame. And I'm wondering if we could have this. Um, is set within six weeks prior to a city election. You know, whenever city council, we go and vote on having an election, and anytime we go and say we're having one, that this is in effect, you know, six weeks, four weeks prior, and then two days after that exemption. Um, just to ruin that. I think it's conceivably we could. I know we always try to tie things like overrides or things of that nature to an election that's actually occurring, you know, purposely. But then again, sometimes we have council elections that come up because of a resignation or something, so there's an election at some time that isn't in the normal schedule. Council. Um, well, two issues. One is, my understanding is we can't do that exactly because we can't, we can't make a difference between a political sign and other signs. Is that part of the reason why I'm doing this because of the Supreme Court decision? Right. The mo the reason why we're change we need to change this is because we're if right now if we distinguish between political signs and non political signs. Um, so I think that would complicate it and get a little bit grayer. <laughs> um, but the city solicitor might want to comment on that. I will say it still says you can have two signs. So whenever there's a primary or a special election, um, you still yeah. you, this would still allow you to have two signs in those special election occasions anyway. So there, I can't think of a whole lot of examples where there are more than two issues on a special election. No, please go ahead. To, to follow up on it. I mean, I'll, just, I'll tell you my overall opinion of the ordinance. It obviously has to be changed because of the Supreme Court decision about this, but. My feeling is that when we start limiting signs in this way, um, it's sort of a solution in search of a problem. I'm not sure we have a problem in Northampton with a proliferation of lawn signs to an extreme degree, such that we have to try and regulate it. Um, and I think that two lawn signs for a 45-day window is very restrictive. And I don't see why it's necessary. I think it's one of the things that would be self-regulating. If your neighbor has like, a bunch of lawn signs, I think that neighbor will hear from their neighbors and probably make their decisions on that basis. I'm not sure how much our current lawn sign ordinance is enforced currently. I don't think people even know about it. Maybe that information can be provided, but um, people don't know about it, in my opinion, and we don't see a proliferation of lawn signs. So I'm not sure what the need is. And the downside is I think we restrict people's right to um, support the number of candidates they wish. I mean, does it, does it apply to a Black Lives Matter lawn sign? So if it's a Black Lives Matter lawn sign, you can't then support a mayoral candidate and a council candidate, because then you're above two. Um, so I think you just run into problems like that. Uh, we try to come up with different uh, calendar restrictions, but as Council Nash points out, that's problematic as well. Uh, with the presidential primary in, in March, special elections, overrides. 
primaries for state elections. So to me, it just seems like, again, this is murky water, and I'm not sure if there's a compelling public interest in limiting lawn signs anyway. I know we can, but I'm not sure it's necessary. I almost would rather repeal the ordinance and then see if we have a problem, and then come back with maybe a restriction. That would be my sense. Councilor Skier, you had a um, I. First of all, this time frame, I think, doesn't address preliminaries in a really good way, because I, I can certainly imagine a scenario where you're going to, where you may want to support more than two candidates. Um, and mm -hmm. just uh, to piggyback on what Councilor Donald just said, I thought rather eloquently, I, I just will never be comfortable determining a number of candidates that I feel people are allowed to express their interests um, in support of. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's not, I'm not sure there is a number that I'm going to come to that I'm not going to go I'm still listening. I'd like to hear what the solicitor has to say. About all this. You have the authority <coughs> to um, regulate the time, place, and manner of sign. It's up to the counselors how that regulation is, is imposed, as long as it's a reasonable time, place, and manner restriction. Uh, as long as you treat all signs the same. So we're in, in the in the arena of policy, and that's what Dr. O'Donnell's talking about. So, oh, please. So, with my idea of, you know, six weeks prior to an election, fit or? I would not. I I would be more comfortable doing it by dates rather than around a particular function that suggests that you're treating political signs different than every other sign, although I will say that during those periods, you could have any sign, as many signs, that has nothing to do with politics, you could have as many signs as you want on your lawn during those exempt periods. Of any nature? Of any nature. So, what's our pleasure? This has been kicking around for a long time. You, I mean, it sounds like the only way to really do what we're talking about is just remove the restriction on number of temporary signs. And I mean, I'd be fine with regulating how far a sign can be to the curb, or maybe even the size of the sign, things like that. But <coughs> the number and time of year, I mean, my opinion is maybe relatively speaking extreme, because I don't even like our current ordinance. Um, that limits it to a 90-day window. So now we're going to a 45-day window. So to me, I mean, one question would be, is this ordinance just inoperable already because of the Supreme Court decision? It's not enforceable. It wouldn't be enforced. So, I mean, my opinion is we don't have to act immediately to repeal it because it's just, it's nothing. But I think we should come back with an ordinance that cleans it up, and my preference, preference would be an ordinance that simply lifts the restriction, except for like distance to the line, and maybe size and things like that. But I don't see any compelling public reason. I know we can regulate time, place, and matter, but I don't see why we should, or why we should spend time enforcing a law about number of lawn signs or time of year, I think it's entirely self-regulating and is not a problem in Northampton as a practical matter. So mm -hmm. I would move a negative recommendation, and then I would hope it would be defeated in council, and then I would like to come back with just a new ordinance with that in mind. So just removing the reference to the number of signs but leaving the remainder of the ordinance well, would not do the trick. In your opinion. Well, because then you still have the, the window. I don't have actually have the print out. But mm -hmm. um, I would want to. I would want to look at it again. I don't think. Yeah, it says in residential zoning now. districts, two temporary signs less than ninety days in any calendar year, freestanding ground signs per lot in accordance with, and it goes on to talk about the sizes, and then it says uh, the provisions of seven e limiting signs to two per lot shall not be applicable October one. Uh, through November 15th each year, all other provisions of 7.3E shall apply during that period. The first thing in 7.3E is the restriction of two signs per lot. Right. If you remove the restriction of two signs per lot and let the rest of that stand, does that accomplish what you're looking mm -hmm. for? And then we can obviously strike the, the language at the end about exempting a time frame. It does the size, it does the distance, and I don't, I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to look at it. To be honest, I don't know if I can do it right now. Also, um, we're going from six square feet to four square feet. 
which I think gets rid of some standard size lawn signs, pretty sure, but I want to check. So, I mean, the whole essence of this is to limit the number of lawn signs and when you can have them, and I just simply don't want to do that. So, I would rather just go oh. no and then come back with the clean ordinance that, you know, another question, if we do this, does the planning board have to look at it again if we really simplify it in the way that Councilor Murphy just described? With that another <coughs> hearing is it a substantial enough change? Because we'd be removed, they would be removing restrictions on lawn signs. Doesn't the plan board have to look at that? Well, I just want to be clear: is 7.2c going to be um, rescinded? Because there's things in here that need to be rescinded, and I would prefer not to have sitting out there if they're unconstitutional. Hence my thinking, if we take out the sign count and move this thing along and then amend it again or fix it again, but the, my, my interest in moving it along is simply to deal with the things that, we're, that we need to deal with around a court decision and deal with this, the count later. Okay, if, if we take out 7.2C, doesn't that take out the ability to have a temporary freestanding ground sign at all? If we take it out without any restriction? That's how I read it because that's what I think prefaces, you prefaces this section. Oh, I'm reading. I yeah. Right. I think it would mean that they yeah. wouldn't be allowed at all. Right. So we can't just strike section C <coughs> without replacing it with. I guess you could replace it with the words temporary freestanding ground signs, period. And then it would just, you could have such things. <coughs> I think yep. that would, I would say that would trigger another public hearing because this is a substantial change from what's being proposed. So, so I, I would do that or, or vote it down, but either way, it sounds like we're starting over again. So, if, but that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. I wonder what you think. You wanna, is it worth keeping it here and continuing to work on it, or as Councilor O'Donnell says, send to Council, see what they do. And if it crashes and burns the council, it starts over again. With and it will start over again at this point next session next year because it'll never get through planning board and do all of that between now and the end of our term. So it's going to be dead for a while. <laughs> Can always send it back to committee or uh, or keep it here because you know this is sort of last stop. But if we change it as substantially as you're thinking about changing it, it probably needs to start all over again anyway. Right. I would recommend that. And then yeah. we have 60 days. Assume that 60 days elapses at some point right before we did a new hearing. <coughs> it's 90 days after the close of a public hearing. Yeah. yeah. Which I think probably covers us for a while. But okay. if we're going to blow it up and it's going to have to start over again with another public hearing and go to council to do what you want to do, then it. It probably makes sense to send it along and <coughs> let it run its course. And if it fails the council, we'll deal with it next year. Okay. I mean, I don't see any other way to do it. So, so I move it negative recommendation. We have a second for that. More discussion on that? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, let's carry that one. Uh, our next thing moving right along is uh, 17379 in order to solve a parking on Prospect Street. And uh, Councilor Donnelly, you want to, this came through transportation and parking, you want to yeah. give us the short version sure. of this one? Um, in fact, I just spoke to, the, well, okay. We're, what this is, is um, on the, I believe it's the easterly side of Prospect Street, well, I'll tell you, yeah, easterly side, um, between the YMCA and the Meadowlark Child Care Building, it's a place of frequent pickup and drop off for Christmas. In addition to the general commotion you have at the YMCA, people coming and going. So um, to kind of address that problem, I met with the, with the Meadowlark and subsequently the YMCA director came to the Transition Parking Commission and we're sort of in agreement that we want to create three 15-minute parking spaces in front of the child care facility, but have them only in effect for certain times of day. Pick up drop on. Yeah, specifically 7.30, 9.30 and then 3.30 to 5.30 and that would free them up for that purpose to the mutual benefit of everybody. Um, 
that suggestion was, to amend it in that way was done in Transition Park actually some time ago, probably two months ago at this point. Um, I'm still waiting for, it has to be remeasured though, because the original ordinance was for one space and we want three. So I still need new measurements from the DPW. To put it into ordinance form. And the DPW is playing to deal with, as you know, so that's kind of the reason for that. Um, but I think there's widespread agreement we just need to get the numbers in there, which I do not have at this time. So. All right, so we want to hang on to this one until next month and we'll get the numbers and it doesn't sound like there's any of There's no objection. I'd like to move it along, but I just don't have the measurements. Yeah. So. All right. Anyone interested in commenting on this one? No parking. We have the numbers. All right. Very good. Then, so. Can move to continue. Continue that. Second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, next is multi use trails, <coughs> which is something that we want to get to a little bit. And now, this, I think, uh, Carolyn, do you want to? Sure. Talk to us about, about this one because we want to get this one going because I think this and this is the one that actually modifies and allows the assisted bikes on the on the road. And right. I saw the planning director driving around on one today, so he's, oh, really? he's ready to go. And point of information that riding. Riding. Over you know yeah, there's a right. request from uh, what I was gonna say is this has been before the Transportation Park Commission twice, in essence, first as a concept before we had the ordinance, and the TPC voted unanimously to recommend <coughs> that this change in use be allowed. Then the ordinance came, and uh, it was not voted on, um, but I would like to suggest we move forward anyway at the uh, suggestion of the, uh, of, uh, the planning department because there's a, there's a crucial timetable that maybe Carolyn can explain. Right. So um, sort of the background is, as we, um, you know, we've signed a contract to have um, Bike Share come to Northampton and they're um, electric assist bikes. So they're not electric bikes, but they're pedal assist. So, um, but currently um, we, uh, on the books in Northampton, we don't allow any, um, Mo co motorized vehicles on the bike path. So if we didn't define it more specifically, then um, the interpretation would be that these wouldn't be allowed on the bike path. And of course, the idea about this bike share is to be able to create um, longer transportation routes using this bike share mechanism. So mm -hmm. we're in the process of, um, we've signed a contract, just moving, um, we're, um, anticipating a May launch for the bike share program. So we need to have all the pieces in place and we're working through the winter to get that done. If you, you guys are about to go into this um, lag period no, of council. Ball, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, with, there's not really enough time to wait for you to reconvene <laughs> next year to do this because we need to have um, you know it rolling um, early in the part of the year. So the idea is to fall back on the um, definition of, um, you know, still not allowing motorized vehicles, but creating a specific exception for um, um, these essentially pedal assist bicycles or electronic, electrically powered um, mobility devices for people with disabilities. So that also, we don't have a caveat for that either on the multi-use trails in Northampton, so we want to make sure we cover that as well. Um, and that we that is specific to, um, you know, based on the um, mechanism and the maximum speed of those um, <coughs> vehicles being um, propelled by human power, um, that it doesn't exceed. Um, is less than 20 miles per hour. So um, that's the nature of the change, is just clean up the city ordinances to carve out an exception for that. It, it, um, I'm going to just, this is 17339. I'm just going to read the first section of it just so you know what we're talking about. Uh, it change, changes bikeways to multi use trails, and it says no motorized vehicles except those defined as low speed electric bicycles. Um, by 15 United States Code Section 2085, an electrically powered mobility devices for people with disability 
or horses will be allowed on multi-use trails or bicycle paths with the exception of emergency and or maintenance vehicles to National Grid, City of Northampton, or Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So it, it essentially expands the bikeways to multi-use trails and allows electrically assisted bicycles or handicapped mobility devices to go on the trails. Is everybody comfortable? Mm -hmm. You're comfortable with that? Any questions? Any public comment on this one? Since we're new to it. Seeing none, any question, further questions from the committee? I have a question. Oh, Council. Uh, enforcing the 12 mile, mile per hour limit, how's that going to happen? Well, <clears throat> um, many of these devices have a cutoff. Um, and certainly the actually the bike share bikes are going to have an upper limit. You could program it oh, all. Okay. So it's fairly easy to so, do that. So more particularly that they should, they, they must be programmed not to exceed. Would that be appropriate? Because what this looks like now is that, you know, you might have a cop on the bike on the multi-use trail trying to take speeds. I don't, uh, I don't, I'm just asking. Yeah, I mean, it would be fine to say that they're programmed not to go, you know, above that upper limit. Um, I think that um, uh, we certainly with the, um, you know, it'll be easy for the bike share bikes mm -hmm. because it's going to be set for the entire system that way. Um, so, but for other people who have electric assist bicycles they are up you know they're program they can or can opt to program them any which way i guess um so in that case then you might have enforcement but it's i mean as it is now there are people on the bike path using motorized skateboards and other things that are not really legal so the only way to address that is to call the police and have them come and enforce it um um, so one of the concerns that was expressed with transportation parking were, were about um, was about the, the 12 miles an hour was, was kind of fast. Is that sort of a standard speed, or how did that speed? Um, so I'm not, so um, the ordinance I'm looking at is maximum speed. Um, is less than <coughs> 20 miles per hour. No, the very last so the, for the two. Yeah. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sean, two. Right. So, so <coughs> there, I don't know if attached, you still have this, but the original um, memo that went forward to council has um, a chart, a table showing um, rider's weight and speed and impacts. And so that was derived from um, looking at data about um, basically impacts if you are hit by a vehicle with someone of X weight and going Y speed. Um, so that's how it was derived. I mean, I don't think 12 miles an hour personally is very fast. Um, people without electric assist bicycles are going a lot faster than that um, on the road and the bike path now. Um, or can go a lot faster than that. So, um, but the, it was, it's really based on that data on the chart that shows sort of um, what those, what that impact could, um, cause, what kind of damage that could cause at, you know, very speed. Councilor Nash. What is the speed limit for the bike trails? Do we have one? Or? So it's just for these power assist vehicles that right. will have this speed. Right. And the idea is they're heavier bicycles than a road bike or a typical, you know, recreational bike because they've got the motor. So they're so that adds to the potential harm if you're going faster. Any other questions from committee members? <coughs> so we have a motion on this one. Move positive. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor of that positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 All right, moving right along. The next one, um, and Carolyn, we may want to ask you about this one. Okay. Um, this is 17389, an ordinance to amend provisions so that existing members of multi member bodies 
are not required to be approved again by City Council prior to appointment to the per to the Community Preservation Committee. In, in essence, the, the composition of the Community Preservation Committee requires membership from the Conservation Commission or uh, from the Recreation Commission or the Housing Authority, and those committees vote to select one of their members to go to CPC. But then they still come to Council to get approved, and what this ordinance would do would not would be not to require that second for us to approve their appointment it would be enough if their sponsoring body elected them is that a clear description i think for everybody here um does everybody understand that one out there i don't think anybody's here to comment on it but if anyone would like to comment on this this would allow committees that have statutory representation on a community preservation committee to appoint those people themselves, and it would not then be reviewed by council. They would be the committee's representative, and that would be. <coughs> Again, this is seventeen three nine eight. Any other comment or questions on this one, council? Um, I, the council should vote on their approval. Okay, so you're not in favor of this. Um, let me read a um, comment from Sarah Lavalley, who's one of the uh, members of the planning department and chairs. Uh, is the liaison to the Community Preservation Commission. That's how she's here. Uh, she says that she's un unable to attend tonight but wants to comment regarding uh, this. The CPC includes appointees from the Historical Commission, Conservation Commission, Housing Authority, Planning Board, and Parks and Recreation Commission. The CPC membership ordinance specifically requires that appointees from those bodies who have already been reviewed and approved by the City Council as part of their appointment to one of those bodies and were initially removed by the council at that point, uh, have to be approved again to be on the CPC. This is not required for similar appointments to other committees on which board members serve, and that the mayor and city solicitors support removing this redundant requirement. That was from Sarah LaValle, who is the planning department staff member for CPC. Um, so the, I mean, the difference is the other boards are in the administrative code. Yeah. So it's just a decision that the mayor made the administrative code and the council through the administrative code to say that's not necessary for those kind of interdepartmental but the cpc is established by ordinance because of state statute mm -hmm. and so and the state statute says the city will determine the mechanisms by which we create the commission the committee and so to me this is this is reasonable especially because the count i think people think it's the community preservation committee that just spends itself but it's the council that makes the appropriations the cpc just makes um, uh, another counselor have interest in commenting on this one? Or? I, I just wanted to point out that uh, this issue came to me in a different context with appointments being made from existing bodies to other boards and committees and whether the, the charter itself which pr provides for uh, your approval for board membership would require that second layer of, of approval. And, and it was my opinion that that was not necessary. It's not speaking to whether the council wishes to have, you know, these, these cross memberships in uh, to the CPC come through the council. That's totally up it's to It's just you. not necessary. Uh, it's not required by the charter. But if we wish it, it's our choice. Again, we're back into the, to the land of policy. <laughs> Um, so, what's your decision on this one? You want to send it along the council and decide it, you know, make our case there whether we should or shouldn't make this change? Is that original? Yeah, we are in the land of policy, so maybe it's a choice for the whole council. Yeah. So, I'll okay. be happy with the neutral recommendation. Are we good with that? Yeah. Second? All right. Then to the neutral recommendation, any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. All right. Uh, now we have taxis back. And taxis, <laughs> um, have we seen John yet? Yes. He's oh, here. John's here. Okay. Um, taxis made it all the way to council and then got sent, it's been very arduous with taxis. He got all the way to council and then it came back here. And one of the reasons it came back here was that John, did John, you want to come up to the podium? Um, John Fry had had an experience with something similar in Amherst. Yes. And you made some comments to us. And right. They my role is weights and measures. Yes. So, weights and measures. Yeah. Yes. so they, anyways, it's back here, and so we're ready for your for your comment and enlightenment on what you think we should.
Okay. So I just read um, the latest updates to the draft, um, and I emailed you some comments. I printed them out if you'd like. Um, so I'm sure you haven't seen it. <coughs> But um, basically some of my comments have to do with weights and measures, and a couple of them I just noticed. Um, but starting from the top, um, I couldn't quite make out. Um, a Northampton-based company must, have, must file for a permit. Um, likewise, a business owner's permit, any business owner must be based in Northampton. Does that mean? that you're not allowing companies outside Northampton to operate a taxi in Northampton? Um, I mean, this listener can speak as I can. Also, the chief um, is here as one of the sponsors, so we can recognize Oh, Casper sure. To also talk yeah, to Chief this. Casper's here. Um, if you have any comment on these, these items, <coughs> please feel free. Because uh, I know this did come up in one of the other discussions that uh, we have our regulations for the companies that we license, but we also do not prohibit cabs from Amherst Reese Hampton coming over here and picking up a fare. And we don't regulate, we can't regulate them at all because we don't license them. Right. So far I'm not in agreement, yes. <laughs> I can answer any questions or if you, if you want to know the background of why it's here, but I don't know if you already know that or uh, I'm not sure what I can do for you, but I'm happy to address any questions you have. All right. Did that uh, answer your question, John? Um, well, I know in other towns, we for in Amherst, for instance, some of the permitted taxis were based in other towns, um, but they got an Amherst permit. So I didn't know if that means, because um, I know one, at least one or two companies are located in East Hampton, can they not get a Northampton permit? Is that the intention here? That's how it's operated. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, right. the, the distinguish something that, something so different is livery, because taxis are picking up hail fares, for instance, and, and liveries are like sure. valley transporter where you prearrange well, for a ride. And that's they come my and other con them. yes. That's my other concern here. Does permit only apply to taxi, or does it apply to both? Because it seemed like in the proposed regulation you're talking about the permit process first, and then it's not until later that you distinguish taxi versus livery. So do both taxis and liveries need to get the permit? Um, yes. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's the And anyone can stop me if I'm wrong, but so uh, 13, 316-17 under business owner's permit. Um, Permits may be granted only to suitable persons, corporations, or other entities who are legally registered owners of said taxi cabs or livery vehicles. Um, so again, that might be a problem for someone like Valley Transporter, right? Would they be able to come in and pick someone up? Yeah. But if they're based here, they have to have a license. They have, they have to have um, okay. a business owner's permit, but others can come into town. But if you're based here, you need a permit. But that's only for livery or for taxi as well? Oh. An out-of-town taxi can come into Northampton and pick someone up? Okay. All right. Um, now, going on to how a taxi is metered, um, that's a, a big change um, from the old ordinance. Um, you're allowing GPS smartphone apps. Um, when you when I originally saw that, I thought it meant that's how you're going to address Uber and all of this um, by allowing Uber to determine a price and allowing Uber to pick people up and transport them. Um, but I I've come to realize that's not what you meant. This is just using a like a Google app to measure distance and then calculate a fare on that. I'll let the chief answer. 
the department did a lot of research into this. Yeah, that we did look into that. We were looking at whether we needed to use traditional meters that would have, you know, that right. we'd find in a lot of taxi cabs or whether or not we could allow a mobile app. And the we met with Mr. Miller from the taxi company and kind of talked to him about, about mm -hmm. this and felt that the apps would be suitable as long as they were visible to the to the person, uh, okay. to the rider. Um, from a weights and measures uh, perspective, um, that doesn't, that's not accurate enough um, compared to a hardwired meter. Um, hardwired meters need to be accurate within 0.3%. Um, and most GPS apps, um, you know, when you record distance on, you go out for a run and you record distance, then you download it and look at the map, you see you, you zigzagged all over the place and you actually ran further. Um, same thing would happen here. Most likely a GPS app uh, would over measure distance. Um, also, there's, there's no way to seal um, a mechanism like that. So that, that wouldn't pass uh, weights and measures standards. Um, Does it in fact need to? Um, they need to have a, a, a method for measuring accurately, and then, but that's a determination that you, that you need to make as to whether this is sufficiently accurate. We were trying to not overburden the taxi companies, and we know that Uber and other similar type Lyft and those companies, they, this is what they use. So we were trying to find a middle ground where we could have a measurement device in place, right. but not overburden the taxi companies by making them purchase additional equipment that other you know, it, drivers don't have. That's sort of a, that's a, 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 an industry standard as it would be for Uber or Lyft or any of the other ones that right. are, the, the public seems to accept those. But they the different. But uh, right. But <laughs> the, well, no, no. That's right now fine. Nothing, so. The difference is that with Uber and Lyft, you get a predetermined price, and that's what you're going to pay. Here, you're not going to get it until you get to the end. And so, um, distance is kind of irrelevant with Uber and Lyft because you're just agreeing to a price ahead of time. Um, if you're not agreeing to a price ahead of time, then you need a, a meter with a high standard of accuracy and um, tamper-proof, and you wouldn't have this using a smartphone app. Nice question, Councilor. Mr. How to do, Mr. Fry, how inaccurate do you think? You said the uh, accuracy, but how bad could it be? Just my personal experience with with running apps, which would be similar, talking one to two, one to two percent, typically, which would be yeah. three to six times as inaccurate as um, as a hardwired meter. Okay. Uh, plus, those are generally um, to the positive against the consumer um, because the GPS points zigzag back and forth because right. of the margin of error. And they said the standard was 3%. 0.3. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess it's weighing that, like the, how bad that would be, the, the harmful effects of that versus burdening, to the chief's point, mm -hmm. making someone have a device that's harder to get. Well, I, or I, I'm not sure what's wrong with the with the uh, zone method, personally. I, I would be in favor of the zone method. Just, I, I don't recall um, when, when we had people are discussing this, do, doesn't, uh, in the instance of Mr. Miller's company, because he's been the most consistent one appearing here, most of the time don't they quote their fares in advance? Is this a change for them? Or? I mean, they right now they use a zone system which has been against the ordinance all along. And the ordinance has always been for a meter, and it's so never sure. been followed. So it's been sort of an illegal system that's been um, used. So um, I think that is essentially what they do. But again, the, the police department did extensive research into this and tried to come up with what would be the most fair way to assess the fares. And this was the 
occupation. Mm -hmm. Further? So, uh, yes, separately, so businesses from outside of town can come in without a permit. Do they have to follow the standards of Northampton or can they set prices in their own way? Uh, what, what's the intention of the ordinance? I would say they can set prices in their own way. I don't know what the original intention of the ordinance was, but that's how they've operated so far is those businesses come with their own rates. We're only talking about who we're permitting and what we're telling them how they have to operate. Okay. Uh, um, Councilor Adam, you want to tell me? Can, can um, Northampton based tax use up their rates under the revisions? Before they couldn't. Like we had hardwired the rates into the ordinance, but that's being removed in favor of just saying they need to be stated up front or posted in a visible way. So I think that would be the same. You know what I mean? Like if you, a taxi company, whether it's based in East Hampton or Northampton, could set their own rates. Okay. Okay. Unless I misunderstood what you were getting at. Well, no, but it sounds like you're saying that those companies don't have to follow the provisions in the ordinance. They don't need a permit, and they don't have to follow having a meter, uh, for instance. I think that's true, isn't it? <coughs> yeah, we're only setting rules for taxi cabs that are, yeah. No license. I, I'm pretty sure that's unusual in the Valley compared to other towns. You would think we would just have rules that if you if you um, operate a taxi cab within Northampton, you will abide if you, by these rules. If you pick up in Northampton, if you, pick up in Northampton. If you transport Northampton and Northampton, or if you transport pick up in Northampton and drop off elsewhere. Yeah. But if you pick up elsewhere and drop off in Northampton, then it wouldn't apply. Mm -hmm. It would just be a totally different ordinance. So. Do you, with that system, and with the taxis that are hardwired, do they then have, can they change their rates? Like, this is the Northampton pickup rate, or this is the East Hampton rate. How does that work? They, most of those meters can program in a few different, uh, few, a few different rates, mm -hmm. and they do for different towns. Like, I know some drivers who had a rate for Amherst, and then, like, a rate when they operated in Holyoke. I would just observe that. I'm sorry. I'm just, just, okay. The complexity of this is, is such that at this point, and if we're going to debate changes, it'd be nice to have specific amendments to debate one way or the other. Because um, these comments are excellent. But I would just be hard pressed to like integrate them into the text yeah. and language today. Um, so. so, yeah. Sorry, one more question. No, Does this al allow Uber and Lyft then? The definition of the smartphone app. Well, we can't not allow them. I mean, they, they have the right. right to operate, so we don't have any control over that. This is specific to just permitted okay. deliveries and taxes. They don't Even if they're based in Northampton. The, well, we, the driver. Yeah, they don't receive permits. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I know sometimes are trying to, to permit them. Right, so what's your pleasure? Do you want to keep this and make substantial changes to it? Uh, uh, Councillor Nash, you had a question. Well, I wanted to ask um, Mr. Fry about um, your earlier email mentioned uh, people on fixed incomes, people with disabilities, and how they might be caught in the middle of certain right. things. Do you want to, could you talk well, a little about that? Uh, back to the definition of livery. Um, under the definition of livery, you're requiring a 12-hour notice. Um, you, you're booking the ride 12 hours in advance, uh, which, you know, when someone's going to the airport, they do that. They call a valley transporter. They, they book it ahead of time. Um, but a lot of people um, treat the taxi cabs or, or liveries, cars, as their everyday transport. Um, they have a very familiar relationship with them. Um, and so they're not calling 12 hours ahead of time. Um, but when they do call, they're, they're getting a ride at a, a set rate that they're accustomed to. Um, you know, 
usually through the zone system. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel like uh, if you require meters, as with now, it's going to end up being ignored and people are going to still go with the set rates. Um, people who are getting these rides every day from the same people. Um, so do you let them skirt the ordinance or do we try to address it now? Any other questions? What's the, what's the uh, is the 12 hour requirement a standard <coughs> definition of living? Yes. So that would be the case now, in a sense. If there's a livery vehicle, it should be operating within the 12-hour window, but according to Mr. Fry, they frequently don't. So they are skirting the ordinance now, in a sense, unless I have it wrong. Um, I think you're saying yeah. that taxi, these folks, which I thought that was a good point that you brought up, but I think it's more they're using the taxi services this way. So they're using right. the taxis as livery services, and they have these ongoing relationships. And I, when I read that, I, the only thing I can imagine possibly doing with that is a and this may muddy the waters, but it, we could allow taxis to operate as liveries, but not allow liveries to operate as taxis. So essentially, if there was a, a preset rate that they are, you know, we don't want to have an ordinance that's impacting <coughs> members of our population who need to get to various appointments and get medications or whatever else. So we could let them operate in that way and still allow them <coughs> the same practice. So our ordinance would reflect really an ongoing practice and probably really works for those members of the population. That makes sense. Yeah, and to that point, which is excellent, isn't that what this does? Isn't the livery, it says livery vehicles should not be hired, shall only be hired on a prearranged basis, minimum 12 hour notice. It doesn't say that taxis Well, taxis a is rate. requiring the metering. So that's the only yeah. thing is if you want to allow a taxi to say they have someone they pick up once a month and they bring to a particular doctor's appointment it's like always five dollars or always ten dollars if you want to allow that relationship to continue for pre-arranged you know services more like livery services so there wouldn't be any metering going on you'd have they, they would have a log and if for some reason that car got pulled over and we checked the log we'll be able to see that it was a livery ride technically and not a standard taxi ride can we explicitly say except for cases of economic hardship or? Well, it would fall outside of the 12 hours. I mean, so it wouldn't need economic hardship. It would just be a livery run, which is a flat rate with no meter, because liveries don't require meters. So they can prearrange any relationship, any right. price that they want. Yeah, there are times where you can treat taxis like liveries for a specific purpose. Could we add that? Right, That's that would be my recommendation to accommodate what John brought up is okay. Well, however you want to do that. Cover those folks. Oh. Yeah, I, I think that would definitely work. Um, so you'd have to change that definition of setting the rates. Would the concern be that the company that's already been operating in this way with zones would just continue operating that way, but use the sheet and you essentially would never use the ordinance the way it's been written as a deck. Can you see what I'm saying? That's sort of what they're doing anyway, except not prearranged. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. So as as it's, as the current company is operating now, they're using a zone system. They're not using any sort of meter, even though that's what the ordinance says. And so if we give them this option to still stay within that system where you can prearrange the amount, mm -hmm. um, and but they just need to log it, What's going to keep them from just doing all of their business that way? Well, that have to be. Operating. It would have to be prearranged by 12 hours. So I mean, that would. It would if we ever did encounter them. I mean, they would have to lie and say that it was a different. You know that they had prearranged a ride. And I don't. I, yeah, I like to assume that hopefully people won't do that. Mm -hmm. But it I'm allows. Right. They'd have to have two logbooks. One or right. in any way be able to document that the person in the car is a prearranged livery ride, just like the livery ride. We have they have to document that the pre range rides. But if you had somebody that went from the Salvo house to stop and shop and back for ten dollars or five dollars or whatever they agreed to, and they've been doing it forever, and the the, the cab operators comfortable with the rate, the, the consumers comfortable with the rate, mm -hmm. and they do it all the time, you know, it's like no harm, no foul. So right. they made that marriage. arrangement. But right. for somebody that hailed the cab and said, I want to go from here to here and it's not a recurring trip and they don't have a relationship, they have to use their rate system. 
uh, to, to decide the process. Yeah. I just don't know if that example, if people call 12 hours in advance, yeah. or yeah. they're like, hey, so-and-so, you know, yeah. yeah. or, or, or if they just right. do it all the time, and right. they, they call and say, hey, I'm ready to go stop and shop, where are you? So with, with the suggestion of taxis being allowed to operate as livery, I thought we were dropping the 12 hour uh, requirement. I wouldn't think that we could because then I would think that really would muddy the waters. I don't know how we would. I don't yeah. know how we'd know. I don't know how we know what was going on. Which was um, and isn't isn't that definition so state? It, yeah. Because they license for the different plates. Yes. That's, yes. that's a state requirement. We yeah. can't muddy with that. Right. Um, but we can change the, the the fee that they're allowed to charge. Okay. Three copies. And I don't know. So we say can we say zones for livery. For, well, for everyday riders, I, I don't know how you want to say it. So when so a cab operates as a livery, they can use zones. When yeah. they operate as a cab, they have to use meters. Yeah, <laughs> but I guess we need to find a way that they're not called livery because the fact is they're not going to abide by the 12-hour rule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so this is this is changing an awful lot. <laughs> to not continue it and <coughs> take Mr. Fry's comments and the Chief's comments and make our changes and, and bring it back. I mean, what's your feeling about it? I don't think we can really make these changes in the middle of a meeting. And we'd have to make these changes by the next meeting to not have this fall into that black hole that happens between sessions, so. Is there any urgency to pass this other than to not do so? It would be annoying to all of us. <laughs> 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 no, it's, we want it done right. I mean, and, and honestly, we've been working on it for quite a long time. Uh, they're already all operating in different ways that are inconsistent with each other. Honestly, it's kind of a mess. Yeah. So we do need to deal with it. Um, I don't. I think the our attention to detail and making sure it's done right is more important than trying to get it done, even though we all want it done. So. Well, then I, I move to continue it with the understanding that at the next meeting we can work out specific language. You know. Maybe if you're the chair of the committee and Mr. Fry and the committee, where, uh, where the, the bulk of this work is done in what? City services or community resources? Community, a lot of it's community resources? Because I know when it, it came here from there and and had pretty much form at that point, and then uh, Council Seawall updated it with state law, and that's how it got where it is now. But this is new stuff. So, so that was a motion to continue to our next uh, our summer meeting. We have a second for that? Second. Okay. Well, before we vote on that, anyone got public comment on the taxi thing? I'm thinking not, but if anybody wants to comment. All right. No before comment. Before you go, can I just, does anyone have any, since the solicitor is here, anyone have any further thoughts on the insurance section, which was a change? Yeah. Um, since yeah. That was yeah, I think we substantially upped the insurance requirement right. for right. taxis. Yeah. So that would apply to both taxi and livery was the intent, right? Right. That seems unusual. That it applies to both, or? Right, typically the delivery, and that's a lot of why we're in this problem is because companies get a livery plate and their insurance taxes. is a lot cheaper. Because right. then they become taxes. No, uh, no questions on the insurance one? No, elsewhere? Well, it's not on the insurance, but with the idea that we're going to look at this again. So what if we said that cabs can operate as zoned cabs or metered cabs? That we kind of break it down that way and um, and then they choose the method that they're going to operate. Does that... Um, are you okay with it? Are you, you seem to be looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I figure I ask you before we go and talk about it next time without you here. I can't say that I'm an expert on the economics of, of cabs and liveries, but um, I think that the cab companies are going to select whichever one costs more. <laughs> I mean, if you Well, and they're already price. doing that, and that if we give, you know, if, if, if we approve two, two different systems for them to charge customers that pass muster for us, then, you know, all right, they choose what works, and, um, and, and then 
I, we're done with it. I, I think what was uh, what's being suggested, at least by the chief, as I understand it, is that when a cab is acting as a livery, they're under the livery rules, and they can't do that in, with less than 12 hours notice. Mm -hmm. So it's not like the cab just going to see somebody in the street pick them up and decide whether they're going to be a meter or a zone. That's a meter. If I get a call 12 hours in advance to be picked up, like the you know the elderly person who has to get to the doctor's appointment the same you know you know once once a month, and they do that in advance, then the cab could act as a livery. Because the problem is livery is going to be cheaper than cabs. And I, what I understood the issue to be was that. Um, that elderly person who has for years been paying five dollars to get to the doctor may not be be paying twelve dollars to get to the doctor because you changed the way that the, that mm -hmm. the, the fee is calculated through a meter as opposed to a flat or its own fee. Um, and so, I think the suggestion is to allow cabs to operate as livery so that when they have that regular customer who's making appointments more than 12 hours in advance, they can charge the lower rate that liveries charge, just like liveries do. But that liveries can't then flip over and become a cab and pick people up on the street. So they can accommodate their standard, every week I go shopping at Friday at two with a, with a livery rate. And they, if you hail a cab, it goes um, so we got a, a motion to continue in a, in a second. Do we have uh, any more? No? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Um, the next one is, uh, I think our last one that we, we've got to bug Carolyn about, and this is 17367, an ordinance to amend 156.5A and C to allow the city of business architectural oversight over some exempt projects. <coughs> Modify the exemption. Carolyn, you want to? I think we talked to Sarah about this once, but essentially, this is is just going to make a change in previously designated staff that decided whether something was exempt or not exempt, and right. now we're going to change that to the board members. Right. That's what I would call it. Yep. Yeah. So um, what this change is taking three. Um, um, items or types of projects that the Central Business Architecture Committee um, is under the Central Business Architecture Ordinance, um, but was uh, determined to be exempt after review by the um, Building Commissioner, um, move those into a more formal but shortened sort of um, review by a committee member and um, staff so that it expedites it, but it provides a little bit um, more review. Um, I have modifications. I don't, I can't remember if you all got this. It went through um, community resources and there were a couple of recommended changes, just little edits to simplify the language. So just so you're looking at the same one, I, I did send this to Laura. Um, but nothing, um, there wasn't really any substantive change, just, um, cleaning up the language a bit but um, these items so this has also gone through uh, the building commissioner was fine with this modification in fact he felt more comfortable <laughs> giving over some of these review yeah. items up to, um, hmm. to this level of review and we actually at our last meeting got some comment from the chair of central business architectural okay. and, and then I think we I think we were waiting for community resources to take action before we actually vote on it. Right. Yeah. I think that's because we had her here, we chatted about it, and then waited for this meeting. And, right. and, and do you recall what the changes were community resources recommended, or were they in it at that time? Yeah, so A, so this just came out of community resources under A, it just um, Central Business Architecture Committee Chair or Committee Designee and Director of Office of uh, Planning Sustainability or Designee shall issue a certificate of non applicability So that first sentence, they were, they were, it was tightened um, from, um, which is sort of um, <laughs> a longer-winded version of that that said that the chair could appoint someone or somebody else and the Office of sustain Planning and Sustainability could appoint someone. And it's really just um, taking the language. So, it's not 
So the building inspector would still be the gatekeeper, and if they thought it was something that was exempt, they'd send it over to this committee to confirm. Right. So the and there were still be items. So originally there are there were um, there are twenty items under the exemption list. Mm -hmm. Three of those would automatically, if they fall in that category, would um, bump up to this um, chair and um, mm -hmm. Office of Planning and Sustainability. The rest would remain under Building Commissioner Review. Mm -hmm. And then there, in, on top of that, there were a couple other edits to those exempt um, item 10, 11, and 12, or minor edits um, that the Central Business Architecture Committee wanted to clean up. And I'm assuming this came from that committee's yes. experience over 10 and 12 years of dealing with these, which ones need yeah, a full 20 years. 20 years. Holy smokes. Um, any members of the committee have any questions about this? Because I'm assuming some of you saw the committee resources and, and it was here last time too. Do you have any, any questions? Any public comment on this one? On the Central Business Architect Committee? All right, hearing none and having no questions, we have a recommendation. Any, any more discussion than that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And I think that frees up Carol. Okay, Carol on the um, and then uh, the, the, the last one before we get to talking about cameras again is an orange road to park in Henshaw Avenue, 17378. And this has been, this came up in August and there was a reason we delayed it, wasn't there? That's what it we still have it now and it got sent in August. Yeah, um, it was it's it was a proposal to eliminate pretty much all parking on one side of the street at Henshaw Avenue. And the Transportation and Parking Commission was sort of divided on that and we asked the DPW to come back with a counter proposal to instead switch it to the other side of the street. So it didn't eliminate parking but you eliminated some of the problems that that parking was causing on the other side of the street. So I would defer to the Vice Chair of the Transportation Parking Commission who could describe what happened at the meeting that I, I wasn't at. Uh, thank you. So the, what, what the DPW came up with was, I have a revised map, I only have one, but I'll pass it around, is um, a pretty great solution, which was to, um, Henshaw, where it's closer to Elm, to move the parking um, onto the other side of the street for that. And then as you go around the bend, there's no parking as there always has been. And then um, as you get closer to Barrett and Crescent, it goes back to the other side where it, it doesn't go back. It remains on the right side of the street. So for that sort of problem area, the parking is going to be moved to the other opposite side of the street. Um, And does the, but the 17378 I have is only talking about the easterly side of the street. Have I got the wrong version of it? Um, it seems like maybe you do. This is because <laughs> it's been around since August. If it got changed, this is what was the. Well, that was what was voted on, like, given a positive recommendation from transportation parking, which shows the both sides. And that, that follows this plan. Yeah, no, it's different than mine. That's different, mine. but this is the current version of it. Well, just to make a point, we would have to vote to adopt those as amendments. Oh, okay, so they, <coughs> so this never was submitted to, this is new to us. That comes from, tra that comes via transportation okay, parking. Okay, so this is a fresh DW. version. So it's different from the one that's actually referred before this committee. So we should amend one to be the other, okay. if we're so inclined. Mm -hmm. Just uh, before we do anything like that, anybody out there interested in parking on Henshaw Avenue? No. There are. There, there are. There's none in this room. There's <laughs> 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 so The people uh, playing the home version of this, watching the video. <laughs> yeah. So, all righty. So, the, and then we're all good with this, right? I don't have any. You okay with this. So you want to make the motion to amend it or move it as amended? Um, do you want to, well, your preference. I, I, I move we approve the original ordinance first to get out of the floor. Second. All righty. Now I'd like to move to amend that with the new language. With this language, yeah. And we have a second on the amendment. Okay. 
So if there's no more discussion, then to, to the amendment, all in favor? Aye. 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 And now to the amended ordinance, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. Okay. That's what I have to do. It's better. Do, do you need this back or? I should probably. Actually, I'm going to give it to Laura to make sure she has, she has the right version of it since it got changed along the one somewhere. All right, now, I'm sure we're going to have some comment on this one because we're up to H, which is 17397, an ordinance to establish restrictions on the use of surveillance technology in public places. Uh, this came here in September, and this, the as I'm sure you all know, have been following this, the resolution has been to council in the past. This is the ordinance, not the resolution, and it is our hope that it leaves here and shows up at council on Thursday for its first meeting. So that's where we're at on this one. And um, uh, Councillor O'Donnell, I know bef before we do comment, you, you're going to propose some changes, I think. And why don't we put those changes on the floor, and, he, and, and then when we get comment, um, pe people will have an opportunity to comment on the proposed amendments as well. Okay. So you'd like to adopt the amendments before there's an actual motion on the main order? No. Okay. I move a positive recommendation of the ordinance. Second. Okay. Right. Now I move to totally replace that ordinance <laughs> uh, with, the, <laughs> with the amendments that are written out here. Um, and if it's second, that I can ex walk you through the changes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Allow me to walk you through the changes. <coughs> I'll walk you through that. Yeah, but now, is this substantial <coughs> enough that essentially it's a whole new document, or? No, you can, you see the vestigial tail in it. Um, it just says major, <laughs> major changes to. Major changes. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and the counselor, too, have you uh, seen these, or? Uh, if they were the ones that we last discussed, I did. Um, if there are any since, you know, Council O'Donnell has been very good in keeping me in the loop on this one, and, and uh, he generally is, does contact me about ordinances he's working on, mm -hmm. which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. That's the All right. Okay. Um, so there, I mean, it reads differently from the first. There are some structural changes, but the substantive changes that are in this version is first we explicitly define the public places where there would be a prohibition on surveillance technology. And that would mean streets, sidewalks, lots, parks, um, and the steps in front of City Hall. And you can read the definition of surveillance technology, which is pretty much the same. We made some changes at the last meeting of legislative matters, um, including removing the, the term mobile phone location readers, which was um, an issue that the chief of police highlighted in her letter to the city council and the public of September 20th, highlighting that would be problematic. And I agree, so that's removed from the definition. Um, the prohibition is substantively the same within the central business district, which is downtown, surveillance technology should not be deployed and or operated in a fixed, position from, uh, a fixed location for a period of more than one day on city property or property leased and or controlled by the city. We use the word city instead of public property since we can only talk about city property. That's another change. Um, and now the exceptions are going to be, therefore, first is this prohibition is not going to apply in any way to the camera currently at the police station on Center Street, because it exists already, so no change there. Um, it also does not apply to security cameras that monitor parking structures, including the police station parking deck, just so long as the cameras in the parking structure aren't peeking over the sides to one of the public places as already defined. Um, third, the prohibition is um, does not apply when the use of the technology is temporary and for the purpose of preventing or mitigating imminent and serious risk to the public in emergency situations. And finally, it does not apply when the use of surveillance technology is temporary and the purpose is in connection to a specific and time-limited criminal investigation. 
Those amendments address two other issues the chief raised in her letter, namely that there is a camera at the police station currently that has some beneficial uses, and uh, also that temporary cameras are used for longer than 24 hours for criminal investigations. And so those amendments, I would think, address those, those three specific concerns, but it still places a prohibition on, on using surveillance technology in any of those other public places downtown. I just want to say briefly, this has been described as a ban um, by a lot of people, including in the press. Um, it is not a ban, technically, uh, because as you see, there are many ways that surveillance technology can be used. They could continue to be used in police cruisers, for large temporary events, for criminal investigations, for emergencies, in parking structures, on the police station, uh, and so on, but they just can't be used on a permanent basis at, at other points downtown to, for general surveillance of uh, people or vehicles. Um, the other important thing to point out is this is not a, a something we're putting in a charter. It's not like a constitutional amendment. It's just an ordinance. So I think of this more as a, a check so that if in the future we, there was consensus that we wanted to put a camera at a place that's currently would be disallowed by this ordinance, it could be done except that we'd have to vote on it and we'd have to have a, the public would have to would have the opportunity to comment and there would be a check against <coughs> so i like to make those you know because we should have a policy on the use of surveillance technology downtown and i think that's what this this represents then uh, to the amendment any So, are we going to do public um, Once I see if you have any questions for Ryan, and then we're going to, now that they've heard it, we will allow our public comment. I just wondered if there's any questions from the committee of Ryan about these changes before we did that. Any clarifications that might help? No? Uh, sure. Um, so, the why are the steps in front of City Hall specified and not other steps? Um, only because they're not streets, sidewalks, lots, parks, uh, but are still a, a common meeting place for people where you would not want surveillance. I think this, I think of the steps as City Hall would be more like, more like a park than just a step, you know, because it's a common gathering place. So I added in explicitly just to make sure it's covered. Okay, but there are other municipal steps. No doubt, yes. <laughs> Well, on another point, just because Council Chair raised it before, at our last meeting, I think at our last meeting, she said, what if we had a, a parking garage that's built in the future, would it apply? And as it was previously written, it would not. But I think the point she made was, was well taken. And so with the amendments, it would. It would be any municipal parking structure, even if one was built in the future. Mm -hmm. But by chair. lots, we mean parking structures, yes. Parking lots, no. Yeah, I think that's why we want to clarify with the exception that we're not talking about parking structures. Yeah. But lots, no but cameras, structures, it's okay. As as it's written out, yeah. Okay. Councillor Nash, any questions before we do comment? Um <coughs> No. <laughs> so um Do we vote on the actual amendment? Motion to second. We have we had a motion to second. We've had comment, mm -hmm. and I think we're going to take public comment before the amendment. Before the amendment. Okay. Yeah. Just we public may have something to say about that that leads to our wanting to discuss the amendments more. So um, no real time limit. Understanding that everybody looks real familiar, so we. <laughs> Uh, you've probably been here before and we're just going to work our way around the room there is no list please tell us who you are and where you live so that we can for the minutes so that we know who's commenting and let's just start up in this corner and we'll just go back and forth uh, uh, and come up to the podium if you would because then you get on camera for for people watching the home version give us your name <laughs> and uh, address and then your comment all right my name is elizabeth humphrey i live at 293 prospect street Northampton. Um, I just wanted to actually, I didn't really have a lot to say, I just, your comment about the City Hall steps, um, and I'm really glad that you included them because that is a free speech zone. 
which um, we shouldn't have to have surveillance while we are exercising our First Amendment rights. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for including the, the steps in that areas that um, it is restricted. Um, and that is not to say that I'm I just, I think it's ridiculous that there are zones for free speech, but that's a whole other thing. So thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank, thank you. you. Bookbinder, you have a comment for us? <coughs> I'm not really prepared tonight, but I do just want to say. Oh, that you got to give us your name and address. Oh, for the record. Amy Bookbinder, Grove Avenue. Thank you. Um, I'm here to say that I would like to see the ordinance as originally written pass. Um, I don't like uh, particularly. I'm looking at the right thing here, I'm a little confused. The number three, the part about when they use their surveillance technology is temporary and the purpose is to prevent or mitigate imminent and serious risk to the public in emergency situations. I think there's a lot in there that needs to be defined better. I think it should be defined by this committee and the city council. Um, I don't think it should be just left vaguely wide open that way. I think that's a slippery slope, frankly, to uh, the police and perhaps the mayor having discretionary power that I don't think we as a city want them to have. I, I want our legislative body to be de defining that and deciding that. Um, I don't know. I reserve the right to come back if I remember this. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, another speaker may trigger your memory a little bit when they come up. All right. Um, and do you have a no comment? Councilor the Barger, do you want to make a comment or are you just <coughs> make a comment, no comment? Okay, sure. Are we only speaking on the amendment or on oh, the, the, the whole thing? The whole yeah. Thing. yeah. Um, Robert Ronsky, 35 Fruit Street. Um, so actually, like the amendment as, as it's written, I think it's uh, very thoughtful. Um, but on, on the ordinance as a whole, I, I think it should pass um, with the amendments. Um, the presentation for why we need the cameras um, has not been well presented. Um, I've been to several of these, and at first it was truth cameras, and then and then it was for the businesses have bad bad cameras, so we need to adapt for that. And then it was crime deterrence. And the statistics that were presented to us and the examples that were presented to us from other towns um, seemed to change or, or under greater scrutiny, it seemed to actually not be relevant to our current situation. It just hasn't been well prevented to have a convincing argument for why we need the cameras. And the voice of the, the, the community is, is very strong that we did that that those cameras uh, shouldn't be there and, um, and I, I think as representatives of the community uh, that's something we need to listen to. Thank you. Thank you. Then uh, behind Councilor Labarge, ma'am, do you want to make a comment? I'm Sharon Moulton, 48 Evergreen Road, number 313. And thank you, Ryan. I, I think that overall it, it was much easier to understand in your version. I, just, I share Amy's worry about the definition of what emergency, what, what you meant, I meant by emergency. I think it'd be a good idea if that was clarified. Thank you. And then uh, on the on the other side of the aisle, if you have a comment, um, not a prepared one. But I if you want to, if you want to come up and speak, please do. Yeah. Just give us your name and uh, address, and then your comment. Uh, Cora Siegel, Union Street in Northampton. Um, I guess just basically like um, I don't feel like I need cameras to feel safe at all. Um, anytime I've needed help or anything. Um, the people who have been able to help me have been like people in my community 
um, very much including like homeless people. Um, and I've never felt like I needed surveillance to feel safe. So thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm Sarah Field, 40 Elizabeth Street in Northampton. Um, I agree with Amy and some of the other people who have spoken. I would urge you all to pass the ordinance as originally written without the, un the unamended ordinance for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I share the same concerns about the emergency situation and what that could lead to. There's such historical precedent for the use of emergency situations to expand executive power and expand police power in ways that are really harmful to to members of the community and to our civil liberties. And so I have great concerns about that um, that language really sort of rendering the ordinance somewhat moot for some of the, the um, in terms of some of the major concerns that people have had about surveillance and its impact on our civil liberties. Um, so that's one of the major concerns I have. Um, and I am also curious about the question that was raised about the steps in front of City Hall and wondering if we could expand to, rather than talking about um, where surveillance is prohibited, talk about where it's permitted instead. That's something mm -hmm. that I would wonder about. Just mm -hmm. so, um, if, we, if we have really limited language around prohibition, that means that there can be surveillance everywhere else, and that's a concern for me as someone who wants to feel free and safe and open to be out and about in public in my community without being watched by the police. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hello again. Um, my name is Paige Henry Bonner. Can, can you speak up a little bit? Yes. Oh, sure. Thank you. No problem. Um, my name is Paige Henry Bonner. I live at 61 Clark Avenue, Washington. Um, and I like to also echo some of his comments about um, emergency situations and how that's good enough, then that can be, um, that can mean anything. Um, so I also support the, uh, the original performance. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, and then, uh, Councilor Birol, you want to make a comment or no? Okay. I'll pass. Okay. Uh, then <coughs> going across. Yes. <coughs> Johnson, I live at 119 Meadow Street, and I echo the concerns of many folks here around the lack of clarity and safeguarding of um, when cameras are allowed in emergency situations. Um, I would also prefer the first version of the ordinance, and if this version is passed, I strongly urge you to um, add additional um, regulations and oversight so that when a so-called public emergency emerges, there's a process by which city council, for example, needs to approve that this emergency reaches the level that necessitates cameras. Um, I also want to draw attention to the lack of clarification and regulations and oversight around which ongoing investigations rise to the level of allowing cameras. <coughs> there is a warrant needed. There's just like a lack of, of language and clarity, I think, that will really be necessary in safeguarding um, the, all of us. Um, mm. Finally, I'm really concerned about the lack of regulation safeguarding the footage from ICE and the FBI. So we've been talking about the sanctuary concerns from the start. And, um, you know, I understand there are reasons why this amendment emerged in a way that doesn't specify this, but we are a sanctuary city and, again, want to just urge the council to take up as soon as possible um, the institution of the necessary. Um, safeguards that will prevent that from happening um, to best that we can. Um, and along those lines, also we need regulations around how long the footage is stored um, and with whom it's shared. And I guess that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Reed Arnold. I live at 35 Clark Street, and I want to second uh, others' concerns about the vagueness of the language, um, what an emergency situation constitutes, and uh, how problematic that can be with the short precedent, um, and also um, with investigations, um, and that also being vague and uh, dangerously interpreted. Uh, 
And so I would urge you not to amend it in this way. Thank you. And we just had somebody come in back there on that side. Are they, do you want to come? I'm not oh, you're here? Oh, okay. Nice Please. <laughs> you just set such a high standard with your comments. Uh, my, my name is Bill Newman, and I live on Lyman Road, and I'm the director of the ACLU in Massachusetts, our Western Region Law Office. Uh, I'd like to make just a couple comments if I can about the amendments. And then I would like to make a couple comments about why it's so important for you to recommend positively and why it's so important for the City Council to pass this ordinance. With regard to the amendments, I, I understand that people have concerns about the phraseology and it is, as other counselors, counselors have said and other individuals have said, there is this sausage making quality to all legislation. And I, I, I share some of the concerns about some of the language, but I take, I think, uh, the view that what the ordinance as proposed by the three counselors said is that those uses of cameras, which have been in place in Northampton for some time, will be allowed to continue. That, that's, that's the gist of it. And the phrasing of the ordinance, I think, is of less concern than the passage of the ordinance. The way in which the cameras have been used and are described in the proposal, I think, is subject potentially and theoretically to being this wedge that opens up this Pandora's box of exceptions. But I don't really expect that to happen because notwithstanding uh, the police chief's position with regard to the cameras, I expect she's going to obey the spirit as well as the uh, <coughs> actual detail and language of the ordinance. I, I, I fully expect that. And I don't really think that's subject to question. And there is a safety valve here, too. And that is that to the extent that any of these descriptive phrases on the exceptions were to be used in a way that is inconsistent with the, both the spirit and the language of the ordinance. We have a public records law in Massachusetts that is quite expansive. And we're going to know about it. Because while there is an exception to the public records law having to do with ongoing investigations, mo the exceptions by and large, the temporary, uh, the temporary use for large public demonstrations and the like, we can do a public records request. And I've been thinking about that. Uh, and we'll find out how this, uh, how this ordinance has been used or not used. And if there is a problem with that, we can come back to the council. But I, again, I fully expect that it, the spirit of the ordinance will be adhered to as well as the language itself. With regard to the process that's been ongoing. It's been over two months of, description, of, of debate and discussion, and I think the time has come to pass this ordinance. I have read with care all of the Chief's comments. Uh, there is, I think, nothing that refutes the essence that if the federal government agencies come to Northampton and say, we want the images you've captured on those cameras Northampton is going to give them to ICE. Northampton will give them to the Department of Homeland Security. Northampton will give them to the FBI. And Chief Casper's comments that were in today's Republican said, well, they've only been used and requested for criminal investigations. Mm. Yeah, criminal investigations, according to the FBI, ICE, the Department of Homeland <laughs> Security. And the comment has been made numerous times, well, Northampton police will not utilize uh, face recognition technology or biometrics or lip reading and all those sorts of technologies. But the Northampton police cannot stop and have no power to stop ICE or the Department of Homeland Security or the FBI from doing exactly that. Right. Which of course we would not allow here because it's totally unacceptable. But when federal law enforcement comes in and says give it to us and we're going to do it, there's nothing we can do to stop it. 
because Northampton is going to hand over those images, as Chief Casper has said. I think, uh, honestly and forthrightly, that's what Northampton's going to do. And I would point out this, even leaving aside if you accept ICE and the FBI saying it's our view of what's criminal and we want the images, there is this old expression about uh, investments that uh, past performance is no guarantee of future results. And I would point out that we are living in the world of Donald Trump and Jeff mm -hmm. Sessions and what has happened before is no predictor of what is going to mm -hmm. happen next. There was a further comment, and I could go through these in some detail, but I think we've been through most of this before, that Northampton's intent is not to become a surveillance city. But that's the unfortunate result that we are talking about as we open up this unnecessary and not particularly helpful, in terms of law enforcement, use of cameras and surveillance. And the piece of this that I find most disturbing is this. This is not an ordinance or proposal that would ban the use of cameras in Northampton, as I went through, I think, in some detail in the piece I wrote for the Gazette. It just doesn't do that. It's never been proposed to do that. So when, and this is a quote, I should point out that our, our city already has a ton of cameras. We have them at our station and in our school and our parking garages and our cruisers. Mm -hmm. As said Chief Casper, and that's, that's true. This is a non-proliferation ordinance. This is to say we want to have control over the amount of surveillance in our city. We want to have it used for a purpose. We want to be able to say when enough is enough. And surveillance of law-abiding persons in people that are in places that are used by uh, many of us on a daily basis that creates a file that will be utilized and can be utilized by law enforcement across the United States, federal and state and local forever, and creating those files and those images, that's wrong, in my judgment. That's not the city we have, and it's not the city we need to have. And when you put up those signs, you are now under surveillance. Welcome to Northampton, have a nice day. How is that gonna feel? Because you're gonna put up the signs, and it's gonna hurt business, and it's gonna hurt our sense of community, and it's going to hurt what we feel is right and just and fair and decent and good about Northampton. I urge you to pass this ordinance. Um, oh no, we still we still have more to go here. We'll just sort of volunteer. Well, well, Miss Gamma, did you want to speak? Uh, Ditto. She passed the first. She passed the first. Time. She, 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 she deferred. Um, I can't really see you. Well, back in the corner over there, I think there's two people back there. I can't see. I'll pass. I lost my voice. Okay, and next to you, uh, there. I, no, no comment. No comment. And uh, the counselors. I think we've got everybody except Chief Casper. Do you want to make any kind of comment? No, thank you. No, thank you. So. Can I? Because I wasn't prepared to speak at all, and I wanted to. Well, yeah. If you've got something you'd like to add to your comments, yeah, feel thank free. you, man. Yeah. Um, do I need to state my name again? Sure. Okay. Elizabeth Humphrey, 293 Prospect Street. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, I do agree. Actually, I want to parrot pretty much everyone who wanted the original ordinance without these amendments. Um, although I think much care has gone into them, and I thank you for that. Um, especially with the, I think it's the number three, where it is the emergency situations. I would like to see a little bit more clarification the level of emergency and also um, what warrants an investigation whether it's just a suspicion or whether there is actually a warrant um, mm. yeah and so I wanted to pair all of those and I wanted to add mm -hmm. my comment to that right, thank you good. so thank you so from what I can tell we have been around the room anybody out there that wants to comment that is not yet done so Okay, thank you. So, we have an amendment to the original motion that's been made and seconded. Discussion to the amendment? Any? Um, one other, so, but I also thank you for um, these extensive amendments and, um, and I think you addressed a lot of the things that I've, I've brought up. Um, I continue to wonder about city-owned buildings or building 
that we have at the moment that are in the central business district that we lease space out of. Um, so we are the landlords for organizations. So um, I, I'm concerned that we are putting a prohibition on how a tenant would use that space if they felt like they needed something that would fall under this. I think that is accurate. I think that if there is a, let's see what it says. Um, yeah, surveillance like analysis should not be deployed and or operated, et cetera, et cetera, on city property. So it doesn't make a difference whether or not that city property is leased out to, to others to use. But again, the prohibition is on putting a camera, for example, on such property that would surveil a street, a sidewalk, lots, parks, or the steps in front of City Hall. And it seems to me that there I can't think of a tenant of a city building that would have any reason uh, or moral, moral authority to do that. They may want to look excuse me. They may want to have a security camera to monitor something inside the building or something, but that's not so when you say on city property, that doesn't include inside city property. On, I read that to mean mm -hmm. inside also, on, like a camera would be fixed on property, but it'd be indoors of that. It's, I think the, the way that's explained is in the definition of surveillance technology itself, <laughs> which is the only thing that this deals with. Surveillance technology means Hardware or software that records and or transmit the image, identity, movement, or actions of individuals or vehicles in public places, etc. So, what is a public place? Is it street, sidewalk, lot, park, or the steps in front of city hall? So, so for your from your reading of this, it wouldn't if if there was a camera that was looking at say like a front door to see who was trying to enter the building. That would not be prohibited. Well, certainly, it would it would be prohibited on the steps of City Hall, which is a common entrance. Um, this, as you know, is just in the central business district. But let's pretend it's not for a second. I'm pretty sure the DPW has security cameras on some of its properties, for example, and that's not prohibited by this ordinance. As I read it, even if it, even if that was on again, mm -hmm. we're pretending central distance is mm -hmm. Even if that looked at the sidewalk, I mean, if it was on the build, you know, if it's on a building, but it's there's a sidewalk in front of it. You can't look at the sidewalk. That's why even when we clarify the the exception for parking structures, that says, um, you know. It doesn't apply to security cameras that monitor parking structures, including the police station parking deck. So even the roof of the parking structure is something I, the solicitor and I have talked about. Um, so long as such cameras do not monitor public places outside of the parking structure. So it can monitor whatever, as long as it's not monitoring common places where we want to prohibit surveillance. So if there was a city building, for instance, at after hours, you could be buzzed in and part of that system was a camera so you could see who was asking to be buzzed in, but that camera actually, you know, shot the person standing in front of the door and whatever was behind them. Would that violate this? I don't think so. I, I, mean, I should say some of this is hypothetical. I'm not aware of how many, how many cameras do we have with that kind of security I, I don't know yeah. how many we do have or if we even have them. That, uh, you know. I guess my answer was that that's not my intention. I do not believe it's prohibited by this ordinance. If we were ever, if we ever <coughs> said, oh, we, we desperately need a, a surveillance camera to monitor an entrance to a building and it conflicted with this ordinance, we could amend it. Um, any other any questions on the amendment? Yes. Um, just like the comment. Um, that I, I really appreciate all of the work that Councillor O'Donnell put into this, and that um, I it, it really is started getting into the, the the details of you know and this discussion is pointing out like where we can go because you know cameras 
take in a lot more than what we intend to take in. And um, so, um, but I, I did hear a lot of public comment against this, the, the amendments and um, that I'm, you know, I'm, you know, if, as we're getting into this, I'm hearing the, the feedback, don't go there. And, and I'm also thinking that, you know, that, I, that, that what we're talking about now is, is different from what was sent to us by council originally. And, um, and that I'm thinking that people want us to speak to the original here. And, um, and, and I think if we, we go here, this becomes a more lengthy conversation too. And um, so that's, those are my thoughts at this point. Um, I did have a question um, related to um, language in, in, in the amendments, but also um, uh, that I was hoping to propose for the original or ordinance. And it has to do, uh, and I'd like to ask Chief Casper, um, the, it, was, it was raised, the, the concern about if there were an ongoing um, investigation mm -hmm. and that, um, so what would, what would trigger that? Would it be a warrant? Would it be <coughs> suspicion of some sort of activity? And also within that, you know, um, our, our status as a, um, uh, as a sanctuary. sanctuary city, thank you. <laughs> I need dinner. Um, that, with that in mind, you you wouldn't be you know if there's a criminal <coughs> investigation going on, it wouldn't have to do with that. It would be you know like there's some sort of drug activity, you know, there's some dealing going on or something like that. So you're asking what would rise to the level of, of yes. the okay? Yeah. Uh, it the would be, we wouldn't have a warrant. <coughs> we probably wouldn't need the cameras in the first place. A warrant, you get a warrant meeting certain levels of, of you, evidence that you already have. So um, in most cases, it would be, say for instance, we have information that someone is trafficking narcotics and has weapons on Main Street. That was one of the cases that I brought up earlier that just happened about a month ago. So you develop that information, um, you get it through reliable sources, but you don't have enough to get a search warrant yet. You, you need to develop that. It's very challenging to investigate drug trafficking on, on our street particularly. It's a straight street. so. There's not a lot of places to kind of use um, traditional strategies, which would be putting officers out there in different places. And we do that all the time, and that's what we, we did in that case as well. Uh, but that would be an example of when we might use a camera. Uh, the human trafficking cases are other examples where we didn't have enough evidence to get a warrant yet, but we wanted to do surveillance to develop that evidence, and then we would put them in. Um, the, the arson spree that we had would be an example of like we have concerns about an area, although written into this ordinance, I don't know, I think it is written in, in a way that it would allow us to um, use that. Would you agree? Could, that if, you, if we had, what you read? well, we weren't investigating like a particular, like the two examples I just gave with human trafficking or the, mm -hmm. the other, but if we had an arson spree going on and we had concerns about an area, um, I believe this ordinance and the amendments that you made would allow that still in the downtown business. Is that accurate? That would be my hope. The, the only yeah. qualifiers are we're talking about a specific <coughs> and time limited criminal investigation. Right. So, and I think that's why the and that's why the 24 hours didn't work originally. <coughs> because I can't predict when someone is going to go and light things on fire. You know, and I don't know if they're going to do it today or if they're going to wait a few weeks until time passes. Um, we have the gentleman that's been going around. Um, openly masturbating like I don't know when he's going to do that again so those are just like the reality of the situation right we have a bunch of victims out there in downtown who have been the victim of this person he hasn't done that again in a little while um, so that would be another example if it was happening with consistency in a similar location where we might put a camera up to see if we're able to identify the person that's doing it so those are a few examples, but I can answer, if you have something more specific, I can answer that, but those are just examples that we've already used cameras in. So to allay the concerns of some of the people here tonight, that so what would trigger this is that you, that the police department is like, oh, we have something that's worth investigating, and then you, you start, 
I mean, I'm, I, I don't know how this happens, but you, <laughs> you start an investigation. So you've had a report of some sort of criminal activity going on, mm -hmm. um, and you start investigating, and then you determine that cameras might be helpful. Right, and I mean, they're not frequently used. The great majority of cases that we have, as far as when we develop information early and we're trying to figure things, I mean, cameras aren't always what we go to, but there's some situations, like the examples I gave you, where they make sense, they're an appropriate use of it because we can't always predict everything or we can't put our officers out there without them being seen right away and then the narcotics activity will not occur. You know, So um, I guess it's just a matter of case by case, which is why it's hard to write an ordinance to control it because I, I can't predict things. I wish I could, I'd be much better at my job, right? If I could predict everything, but I can't. We do our best and we, we use information we have to guess when something's going to occur based on information. But based on the way this is written, you're not going to randomly just start putting up cameras it, and, and say you're investigating something. Uh, that would be lying. That would be unethical, and I would never do that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, more questions for the chief? Anyone? Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, so, to the amendment, any other particular questions, or would you like to vote on the amendment? I should just say I want to vote, but I think um, Councilor Nash's point is is really good, and I feel like I would like to address some of the public comments that have been made because people have shown I mean, people have shown up time and time again to these meetings, and uh, I really appreciate the uh, the civic involvement you've shown. So I, I'd like to just discuss some of the objections that the public has raised just briefly. Um, with regards to safeguards about what ICE or a federal law enforcement agency can take, I don't believe there is a safeguard we could write into an ordinance that would prohibit that. That's why we just are prohibiting cameras, mostly, except for specific things where we allow them. Um, with regards to the emergency situations and criminal investigations, um, I agree with um, what Bill Newman said. Um, there are times when, in theory, I guess, just if you read it just word for word, I suppose it's a loophole in a sense. But I don't think it's a practical loophole. And I think that if it were, what we're really talking about is will it be abused by the Northampton Police Department? And to his point about public records, if it turns out it is abused, then that's a, a new conversation that calls for revisiting the issue. But I think that as, uh, on, on principle, there could be emergencies. And there are legitimate criminal investigations. So there are, there are abuses potentially, but there are real uses for those exceptions. And I think because of that, I'm comfortable. That's why I offer I don't think any ordinance is going to be perfect or complete, and at some level, you also bump up against to up against the separation of powers principle that we have written into our charter. Um, we can't dictate to the police department in great specificity how they run their department. Other cities with other kinds of government, other forms of government, have more power to do that. You may those city councils may require greater reporting, or they may require this, the police department to come to the council and ask for permission to do X, Y, and Z. I think we run up against that. Um, but it, it, what we can do within the city of Northampton, acknowledging the practical realities on the ground, um, this is a, a major improvement from my perspective as the author of this, along with councilors Klein and Dwight. But we should also remember that right now there are no rules. It, it, the status quo is pretty much anything goes the status quo. So that's, it may be overly pragmatic or practical. Maybe that in my heart of hearts, I wish it were, could be stronger. But to me, this is the strongest thing that can be put forward. And it's enormously important to get community input, uh, input from our solicitor, other members of the council, from the ACLU and the police chief. And I feel that we've done that, um, although it is not perfect. But we should pass it and then we should monitor it as we do all important laws, we can't just stop being diligent. If this were passed today and it were done and on the books, we can't stop being diligent. We have to keep monitoring the situation. Mm -hmm. Just to state that. Okay. 
Sure. I just want to also address the issue of emergencies because it did occur to me that when this language was inserted, um, you know, we could make this a much more um, convoluted ordinance. But the, the concept of emergencies is something that is, is well worn in the law. I mean, you know, we have emergency meetings that don't have to comply with the open meeting law. We have emergency exemptions and exceptions in all kinds of laws. So there's a, a quite a body of law around the concept of emergency. And to suggest that just because we put this uh, ability to act in emergencies is going to give this unbridled discretion to the executive, it's just, it's just not true. Um, you know, every uh, statute and every ordinance uh, the words are interpreted, uh, unless there's some technical meaning, they're interpreted in the, the usual common dictionary type definition of the word. And so to say that every event is an emergency and that's in the discretion of the executive is not true. Um, did it come to you what your comment was? No, I have a new comment. <laughs> okay, okay, but just quickly, because we're yeah. past that at this point. Well, I would, um, like to say that I think because of what you just said and because of what you said um, about the fact that we don't have that ability in this city, then don't put the amendment in. That's a very, re that's a very good reason to not put it in, number one. And number two, and I hate to go again, you know, up against you and what Bill Newman said, that's pretty risky, but um, <laughs> In terms of let's try it and see what happens, I, I'm, I'm not, and, and also to address you, my concern isn't that the police is gonna, you know, wants to screw us over on this, okay? That, that, that's not why we said what we said. But in terms of letting it happen and let, let's see, well, I think that's easy for some of us, most of us in this room to say, but, you know, if you're an immigrant, it's not mm. so easy to say, let's wait and see, because you might get detained. You might get deported. It could happen. And so I think, you know, and then it's too late. Then it's just too late. So I, I really think, um, as I said before, it, it opens the door. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So to the amendment, with that said, are we ready to vote? All right, you ready? Everybody, you ready? All right, all in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. All right, the amendment carries. Then, to the motion as amended. Discussion on that. And hush falls over the crowd. <laughs> Well, I, I, I will just state that I, I have not and, and have not changed my mind on supporting it. I'm going to oppose it primarily because I, I, I think it's too big a carte blanche brush stroke to just say no in advance. Um, do I think we need cameras everywhere? No. But we retain the power of the purse. These things are expensive. And if, if the administrative side of government or the police was going to propose to put a camera somewhere, we'd have to agree to pay for it. Uh, they're, they're not in the budget. We'd have to pay for them, and on a case-by-case -case basis, we could say no. So I don't need believe that we need to with a broad brush stroke in order to say we can never do this, mm -hmm. because I think if the administration was going to propose doing it, they'd have to bring us a proposal. We'd have to listen to the merits of it and decide whether to fund it or not. Uh, we would we would always have that authority to say, in general, no, it doesn't work for me. When I know we could say no on a case-by-case -case basis if they came up and decided to propose it. So that's my primary reason for for disagreeing. Yeah. Oh, please. No, I, and I appreciate and respect that, and I also respect that you've been very consistent the entire debate about this. <laughs> you just come come right out and stated your opinion. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. and that's, I don't repeat myself, but I respect that a great deal. Um, it may or may not assuage your concern that I think because this is not a charter amendment, just an ordinance, the very same thing could happen. If, for example, someone said, even, you know, 90% of the city, even Bill Newman wanted a, a camera um, on a certain street in the city. 
<laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> 39 Main Street. 39 Main Street. Things have happened. First of that can Stranger things have happened. But not that strange, now that I think about it. But that could, be, that could be added to the exceptions. You see there is an exception now for the police station. It's just that we would have to hold hearings about it. So maybe that assuages your concern. It doesn't. Yeah. I understand. Well, the more exceptions an idea needs, the less good an idea was in the first place. But that being said, um, okay. I've made my statement. And if there's no other comment, we can, uh, we can vote on it. So all in favor of the amendment, Add, uh, the uh, motion as amended, please say aye. 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 Um, and opposed? Opposed. Okay. So that's a tie vote. It doesn't leave with a positive recommendation. Do we have a, another motion? I voted for the amendment. A neutral recommendation, perhaps. Perhaps. Um. <coughs> I do think, in, 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 the, in the interest of everybody that's put a lot of time in this, I think this deserves to get to council okay. for debate. So, well, while I'm not in favor of it, it, it deserves to go there. Are you moving to neutral recommendation? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then I will. We have a second for neutral recommendation. All right. Any discussion on that? All in favor of a neutral recommendation, please say aye. aye. And I'll remain opposed. But that motion carries. So this will appear on the council agenda on Thursday with a neutral recommendation, but they're nonetheless to be voted on. So is there any other business to come before us this evening? I didn't hear any. God bless you. So it doesn't matter uh, are we going to pass? Yeah. Well, the amendments are lighter. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. The amendment is being given to the